Welcome to First Christian Reformed Church. This day that we can join together online to worship the Lord. It's a little different than we're used to, but given the situation with the coronavirus, uh, we feel this is the best step to take today. And we'll uh, just welcome everybody to be able to worship the Lord. I'd like to start with some scriptures that express our strength and our comfort in the Lord in an uncertain time. These are words from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And in that spirit of confidence, we draw together, maybe not in a single building, but around the, the world today, and we are one in faith, express the good news of the Lord. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, through the work of God in his Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I share some more words from this uh, word of the Lord, and I'd like to share from Matthew chapter 6. In a time and an age when there's a lot of anxiety and insecurity, uh, the Lord Jesus opens to us the ways of the kingdom of God. And in following him, uh, he frees us from worry so that we can do his will and seek his kingdom. And I'd like to share from Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Isn't life more important than food? and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The, the days are having their troubles, uh, but the Lord has given us a comfort. That comfort is expressed in Lord's Day 1 of the Heidelberg Catechism, and I share that with you to express our only comfort in life and in death, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. What a blessing to know that he watches over us in that way. Uh, so whatever we face, we know that he is with us. Let us go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that through technology we can continue to uh, hear your word and pray to you and be together, even if it's not um, in close proximity, that we're able to join 
uh, together nevertheless. So we ask that your, your blessing be upon us, your people today. Help us to be healthy. We pray, Lord, for those who are uh, ill with the coronavirus right now. Uh, help them through this time in their life. Would you bring them back to health and strength? Uh, we think of those who are older and, and the very young whose immune systems aren't strong. Help them to fight this battle and to emerge and to be healthy again. We think of those who are lonely because they have been quarantined and are unable to um, express or experience the, uh, the blessing of community and being together. Um, help them through this time of need. Um, we pray for those who are uh, dependent on in these times, uh, for people who are working in grocery stores and for those who are um, delivering food to those stores, the truck drivers, and for first responders and for hospital workers and doctors and nurses. Uh, would you keep them healthy as they help others? And... Um, we thank you for good news for Ordi Ekoff this past week that she was able to uh, come home to her place in Arlington and that she didn't break her hip, but instead that she had a torn tendon and pray for healing for her and thanks that she can go back and, and have the therapy she needs there. Lord, um, be with your people today. Help us to be strong and healthy and to present a good witness to our faith in Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. At this time, uh, we sometimes have an offering in our church. Uh, we're obviously unable to do that in the same way that we used to. But if you would like, and you're led, uh, you can gladly um, bring a contribution, mail that contribution in to First Christian Reformed Church or to Wellsburg Reformed Church, and that will help the deacons to continue in their ministry. I'd like to continue our series through the um, Lenten series through the book of Judges. And today's chapter is from Judges chapter 11, and it's about the story of Jephthah. If you're following at home and you would like to get your personal Bible at this time and just follow along through Judges 11, you're welcome to do that. That'd be terrific. Judges chapter 11. Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You're not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tov, where a gang of scoundrels gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites were fighting against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tov. Come, they said, be our commander, so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you'll be head over all of us who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We'll certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them. And he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you've attacked my country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers, When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king, saying, This is what Jephthah says, Israel didn't take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. 
Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They sent also to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next they traveled through the wilderness, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his army and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and his whole army into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. Now since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Will you not take what your God Chemosh gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we'll possess. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I haven't wronged you, but you're doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I'll sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Aror to the vicinity of Mineth, as far as Abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you have brought me down. I am I'm devastated. I've made a vow to the Lord that I can't break. My father, she replied, you've given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I'll never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. She was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Brothers and sisters and the Lord, have you ever had a slice of humble pie? An elder told me a story once of a salesperson. This salesman was working on a used car lot, and there was a person on the lot who wasn't dressed very nicely. Well, the salesperson didn't pay much attention to them. They figured that they'd never be able to buy anything anyway. Well, as it turns out, the person found a different salesperson and they decided to buy the most expensive car on the lot. Not only that, they paid cash out of their pocket. They opened up their billfold and paid cash for the, for the nicest car on the lot. 
That first salesman had to admit that he had not judged the man correctly. Well, the elders of Gilead did not do a very good job with Jephthah. They had cast him out of the land. And after they had experienced the threat of the Ammonites, they needed to go back to Jephthah and ask for his help. No doubt a slice of humble pie for them. But let's look to the passage and learn from the context uh, about what's going on here. There's a sad refrain that happens time and again in the book of Judges, and we've uh, noticed that before already. And again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That refrain happens again in chapter 6, verse 10. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And what happens? Well, as happened in some of the other stories, the Lord send, sells them into the hands of raiders. This time it's the Philistines and the Ammonites who make life miserable for God's covenant people. And they cry out to the Lord, except the Lord has already been through this time and again. And the Lord responded by telling them, well, why don't you go to your, uh, the gods you've chosen and, and get help from them? But they persist. They ask for forgiveness. They, they put away their foreign gods. And we read of the Lord that he could bear Israel's misery no longer. So uh, the Ammonites in coming against Israel, the elders of Israel needing to find someone to lead their army, decide that Jephthah would be the best choice. After all, he was, as the text puts it, a mighty warrior. And so they go to Jephthah, who doesn't have terrific reasons for helping them out. After all, he had been kicked out of the land by them. And we might add, why? Well, the story is that Jephthah's father was Gilead, and his mother was a prostitute. We don't read of a name for her, but Gilead had Jephthah with this prostitute. He decided that he would take Jephthah into his house, and he also had a wife and had children with her. Now, there seems to have been some real tension between uh, Jephthah and the others, to the extent that when the others grow, they kick him out of the house and essentially disinherit him. He said, you're not going to get any inheritance with us. Why? Well, it isn't because Jephthah had really done anything so bad. It was just because of uh, what his father had done with his mother. So Jephthah flees, not having anything to his name, not having an inheritance. He goes to the land of Tov, which means the good land. And it's sad that he had to leave a place in the promised land to, to find uh, a better life. But that was what, what happened. And there was a gang of the Texas scoundrels. Uh, another way to translate is gang of empty men. So it could be a way of talking about somebody's character, that uh, they're, they're a scoundrel. But it could also mean talking about the fact that they didn't have any inheritance in the land. And that um, is uh, very possible as Jephthah himself was disinherited and he found a group of others who were essentially in the same boat. But they saw a leadership quality in Jephthah and so they gathered around him and they followed him. And then the elders of Gilead come to him and they have this question for him if he could lead their military against the Ammonites. Now, he's not terribly anxious to help. He says, you're the ones who kicked me out. Uh, why do you want my help now? But they give him their word, and they promise him a leadership role in the land. Well, he agrees, and he brings the matter before the Lord. And as his first order of business, he sends a message to the Ammonite king and saying, what do you have against me that you come and attack my land? Well, the Ammonite king claimed to have ancient right to that land and that the Israelites should give it back peaceably. Jephthah knew the Ammonite king was not right in that. 
He had his view of history, but it was wrong. It was skewed. And Jephthah replies with the truth and a covenant view of things. He knew that long before that land was not Ammonite land, but that it was Amorite land. And the Israelites, as they traveled from Egypt into the Promised Land, sought to um, go peacefully through lands to get to the Promised Land. But the kings along the way weren't always very receptive to them uh, going through their land in a peaceful way. They had to out, skirt around the outside border. But when they got to the territory of the Amorites and they asked for a safe passageway, the king there, instead of agreeing or just denying it, he mounts his troops and decides to attack. And this is a danger to the Israelites, but it's also a danger uh, to the covenant. What happens if Israel is stopped and defeated and no longer able to go into the land that God had promised them? So the Lord gave the Ammonites into the hands of uh, the Amorites into the hands of the Israelites. And as part of his goodness to them, gave them that, that land. And they had been there for centuries. Well, now the Ammonite king was uh, challenging the Israelites. And Jephthah says, Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day. Now, this is the only place in the book of Judges where the word judge occurs. And it's applied not to any human person, but it's applied to the Lord, the, the judge, the true leader of his people. But the king of the Ammonites didn't pay attention to Jephthah or the, the claims of the covenant Lord, that this was the land of his people. And the Lord would defend his honor. Um, we read of the Lord sending his spirit to come on Jephthah. This spirit would empower him to lead and to move forward and to advance his plan in this world. But Jephthah goes out, and the next thing he does, we don't read of him going out to fight right away. Instead, we read of him making this awkward vow, this vow that says, if you give the Ammonites into my hands... Whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I'll sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Now these words are deeply troubling in various ways. Uh, number one, um, it doesn't belong to a follower of the Lord to try to manipulate the Lord. That's what the pagans did with their gods, but that was not to be what the Lord's people did. Uh, how they behave towards him. They weren't to manipulate him like that. But the second problem with it is that it seems clear from the passage that he's intending uh, to bring a human sacrifice to the Lord. And that's not what a follower of the Lord should do. Jephthah, as this book continues to spiral down and the situation seems to get worse and worse in the covenant people and the covenant land, it seems that he, as a leader of God's people, was not very aware of the Lord and who the Lord is and what he seeks for his people to be and do. For instance, in Deuteronomy 18, he says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire. But that is what Jephthah vowed to do. Now the Lord, after Jephthah made this vow, still gave the Israelites a great victory. Jephthah went out and he conquered and several cities and the Ammonite threat was no longer. And so in victory he returns home and we read who comes out to meet him except his daughter. His daughter. Some have thought that perhaps she had known already about what he had vowed and that she was sacrificing herself instead of someone else coming out to meet him before she could, maybe her mother, maybe some other servant in the household, that she was doing something heroic here. But when Jephthah saw her, he lamented. He tore his clothes and talked about being devastated, and he intended that he still had to keep his vow. But again, if he had known the law of the Lord, he would know that there really isn't a necessary a connection there. 
in Leviticus 5, 4 to 6, God's law says that if anyone thoughtlessly takes an oath to do anything, whether good or evil, in any matter one might carelessly swear about, even though they're unaware of it, and they learn of it and realize their guilt. When anyone realizes their guilt in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned, and as a penalty for the sin they've committed, they must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for them for their sin. In other words, Jephthah didn't have to go through with it. He could have substituted uh, a different offering, a, a lamb uh, or a goat from a flock. Kind of like what we remember with Abraham where the ram is caught in the thicket and he offers the ram instead of his son Isaac. Nevertheless, Jephthah thought that this is what he had to do. Now, he gave her time to go and mourn with her friends that the, the goodness and the blessings of life that she would not experience, perhaps wishing in his soul that she would never return. But she did return after the two months, and we read, he did to her as he had vowed. And it seems then that there was a child sacrifice in the land. Now that was to characterize other faiths and other religions, but that was not to characterize uh, the way things were to go in Israel. Uh, he had done a wicked sin against the Lord. And it's somewhat surprising then that later, much later in the scriptures, that in Hebrews 11, he is listed as a man of faith. But the thing is, and the hard truth is, that sometimes believers and Christians do terrible things. Abraham had done his share of sin in his life, and we all contribute. And it is the Lord who ultimately is the judge. He's the only one in this book who is described fully and accurately as the judge. And he's the one whose spirit comes upon his people to bring deliverance. The Lord is the one who maintained his honor in the world when it was challenged by an Ammonite king. It's the Lord who continues to march his plan through history. Though we must realize that this does not mean that the Lord approved of what Jephthah did. But if he can work through sinners like Abraham and Jephthah, he can also work through us. Yet we look to him as our judge and find in his son, Jesus Christ, uh, the one who is the completely honorable and faithful judge over all. The judge who faithfully honors God in all he says and does. The one who sends his spirit, much as we read God sends his spirit to Jephthah, to enable him to do the mission, the Lord sends his spirit into the world today to his people to guide us in the way of salvation. But what does that salvation mean for us right now in coronavirus time? Well, we do know that it seems that everything is degenerating in some way. But we as God's people can keep our heads. We don't have to be afraid be sensible, but don't be afraid. It means to be creative and prayerful. Today we're worshiping online. Who would have thought some time ago that this is what would, would happen and this is how we would join together today? But this is the way it is. Uh, we are called to continue to be creative in the way that we live out our faith but also to be prayerful. As uh, one saying says, pray towards heaven, but row towards shore. I love that saying because it calls us to put hope in the Lord even as we do the practical things and the common sense things that we're called to do. To wash our hands, to avoid places where we might contract coronavirus or give it to someone else, uh, to practice social distancing, even as we know that if we do that, our God is never distant from us. He is with us and he's close by and near to help us through every step of the way. 
But this virus has had a tremendous impact on our world, not just in physical health, but economic and social things that are different. Students, instead of being in their classrooms, are at home uh, trying to learn online. So there's differences, but we have to be creative, we have to keep our common sense, and we have to pray like mad. But I had a deacon tell me something some time ago that I think is very, very worth thinking about, and that's to keep our eyes open for ministry opportunities. Um, he said there's bound to be a lot of needs that are created by this, and that includes the household of faith. So let's keep our eyes open when there's needs around us to pray as to what's a good way to help in that situation. We live in an anxious world, but we can come to that world with a confidence in knowing that our God is stronger than everything that we might happen to face today, and he's with us every step of the way. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for working in a sinful world and persisting to show us who you are, our redeeming covenant God. You're the true judge, and in Jesus we find the perfect and faithful one who forgives us and blesses us by your spirit for life today, even as we face this virus that uh, is, is spreading. Um, we pray that you, by your spirit, will help us uh, to courageously, creatively, prayerfully, uh, with common sense, follow Jesus out into this world, keeping our eye open for all the ministry opportunities that you have for us, uh, both in and outside the household of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now as we uh, go out and live our lives in this week, wherever God calls you to, to be, go out with the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. And may he turn his face to you and grant you his peace. Amen.